Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jose. I am a fifth year graduate student uh, in, at UCSF. I'm in the chemistry chemical biology program. Um, and my thesis is kind of broadly related to drug discovery. And the whole purpose of my project is kind of develop resources and tools that we hope will facilitate the discovery of a unique class of small molecules or therapeutics uh, known as covalent inhibitors. Uh, so just because it is a very broad audience, I'm not going to get too deep into the weeds of the biology or the chemistry. Um, of course, there will be some chemical structures up there just to kind of convey what we're working with here. Um, and I'll do my best to kind of walk through the idea, um, walk through the idea. Uh, and if there's any questions at any point, please feel free to interrupt me and ask questions. Um, so essentially in the drug discovery field, especially when thinking about trying to discover covalent inhibitors, uh, this is kind of the broad idea here where you first have to find a target. Uh, and these targets like Clem was talking about earlier were, are proteins. Uh, and proteins are things that carry out all the functions in our cells. And more often than not, they're the reason that diseases develop. Um, and the first thing you gotta do when you are thinking about developing an inhibitor, right, is gonna be identify what protein in what disease is important so that you can hit it with a small molecule and then hopefully lead to a therapeutic effect. Um, now, the thing about covalent inhibitors is that they only they also require the presence of a residue on this protein known as a cysteine. Uh, and these cysteines uh, are unique among most other amino acids in that they are nucleophilic or that they're reactive. Um, so here in red, you can just kind of see like the pocket and red is supposed to signify the presence of a cysteine. So step one is like, we know that protein X is important in disease Y and protein X also has the presence of the cysteine that we can take advantage of and target. So most companies have libraries that are, you know, in the thousands, 10,000s large of the different kinds of scaffolds. And these are just small molecules that aren't going to do anything specifically, but they're really good at just finding different kinds of proteins. Um, and ultimately, what you want to do is find something that's good enough that will fit in that, that pocket. And there's biological methods to test this, obviously. Um, and as you start figuring out what's important, what's not important on the scaffold, you can add things, take things away. Um, and finally, when you have something that's good, uh, what you want to do is then add something called an electrophile, uh, which is this little structure there in red, um, which is going to be what reacts with the nucleophile, if you guys remember kind of in Chen Ken uh, back in high school or even if you took it in undergrad. Um, and essentially that forms this kind of immortalized bond, this covalent bond that once it hits that protein at that residue, it'll never come off. And because of that, these small molecules are very effective. Um, so then the last thing you want to do, obviously, is you want to make sure that it's only hitting the thing that you want it to hit. Obviously, if it goes in there and hits multiple other things, that leads to side effects, which is what you see like on the most drugs, there's side effects. And those are caused by this off target. Uh, they hit some other proteins and that results in like headaches or something that is not ideal, but with the benefits, it could be good enough. Um, however, it's not always this straightforward, obviously, because like I said, you have to really know what is an important protein to hit and why and, and what proteins actually have these residues on them that are worth targeting. Um, so you don't even know where to begin sometimes. Um, and then once you get to the very end, you need to make sure that what you what you're testing is producing good quality data to prevent any like missed off targets that you just didn't identify in your screening. So then when you go into like animal models, which are very expensive, or when they eventually go into humans, these will cause some serious side effects in people and eventually make the drugs become recalled, or some people will just no longer be able to take the drug because the benefits are not worth the risks of the off target effects. Uh, so that's kind of where my project is kind of aiming to provide some help in uh, these two steps, the first one and the last one. 
Uh, and when, it, when, when I was thinking about, you know, how to go about this, uh, ultimately what I wanted to do was be able to provide the community of cancer biologists and drug and uh, small molecule chemists uh, the opportunity to basically have a resource that allows them to look at basically every protein that's present in a cancer cell and then every cysteine or every residue that we can actually target that's present in these cancer cells. Um, but obviously there's multiple kinds of cancers. So the ideal scenario would be you have a large panel of cancer cells that will allow you to basically uh, see how different certain cancers that come from different tissues are from one another and how maybe there's different reactivities for those cysteines on those proteins from cancer to cancer. Um, and one of the most well-established cancer cell line panels in the country and arguably in the world is one known as the NCI-60. This is hosted and developed by the National Cancer Institute, which is like under the NIH here uh, uh, over in Maryland. Um, and essentially this panel has been around for like about 50 years. 40 years. And it's used extensively and it's well characterized. And the important thing is, and what I really liked about this panel is that it's publicly available. Because it's the NCI, this is funded by our tax dollars. So any research done on this panel is publicly available. And there's thousands and thousands of data points that are out there and again, publicly available for thousands of compounds that have been screened against this panel. Um, and we know the structures of these compounds because, again, this is all it's supposed to be publicly available. Um, so I thought about taking these 60 cancer cell lines and identifying every single protein and every single reactive cysteine in the proteomes or in every in the proteins that are contained within each of these cancer cells. Um, so that's kind of what my project is doing right now. So. Basically for one single cell line, what I do is generate shotgun proteomics. So this is in the top. And this is just every single protein that we can potentially identify in these cancer cells. Um, and at the bottom here, we have methods in the lab, which uh, we've been doing that allow us to, to identify on the right here, basically what cysteines uh, are reactive. So we're getting, data at the level of the protein, and then data at the level of the residue. Um, so basically multiply this by 60, and then multiply this by two because we're doing this in duplicate. So there's basically 120 data sets at the protein level and at the cysteine level that we're working with here. And the ultimate goal is to compile all of this into a useful database that will allow users to basically look through all of this um, and be able to determine, basically going back to the first slide that I showed you guys, like if they're trying to screen for off targets, what's the best collection of like three or four cell lines that they can use that maximizes the coverage of the proteins that they're interested in. Um, and one thing I forgot to mention too, is that the, the cool thing about the NCI 60 panel is that it covers nine different cancer types. Uh, and those are mentioned here. So I think this data set offers a really cool opportunity to kind of do several kinds of comparisons from within the same cancer type, cell lines that are of the same cancer, or doing a cross-cancer analysis of the protein expression and then the cysteine reactivity. And you can imagine scenarios where like cancers that come from the skin have this protein that has the cysteine that's reactive. And even though that protein is found in all the other cancer types, only in the skin is that cysteine reactive, um, which will then open up the opportunity to kind of develop like a tissue specific small molecule that could be really impactful. Um, so yeah, now the last things I'll mention are just what we want to do. Um, so there's publications already that have done things like this, where this is called like a cysteine set enrichment analysis. And I'm not going to go into all of this, but basically there's code on GitHub that I just can't understand because I'm a chemical biologist. And that's kind of what I'm here for is maybe find people that can actually understand what's going on in the code and help us basically take this and then allow us to plug and play with our data set so that we could begin learning from the things that we're doing in the lab. Um, 
And then ultimately, when we go to publish this, we want to make an online tool that will be published alongside this um, that will allow people to, like I said, generate their own cell line panels from the data that we're generating um, or do their own kind of analyses within the app or extract the data for their own purposes. Um, so lots of opportunities with this data that we're generating in the lab. Um, and I'd be happy to talk more to people if they're interested after this. Um, but yeah, I'll take any questions if there are any questions. Yeah. So often for compounds to move forward and so forth, uh, companies need to get investors, and uh, that can be quite expensive process. So let's say with this publicly available data set, as they find, oh, we can hit the system and support. Is there a way to... Yeah, I think that the tool itself, once it's published, will not be patentable because of the fact that we're working in collaboration with the National Cancer Institute. So this, like when, when we agreed to collaborate with them and do this, there is like a materials transfer agreement and all that. And then part of that was that once we're publishing this, all the data that we generate will be handed over to them and it'll be hosted on their government website and it'll be basically a just publicly available data set that, um, you know, that's kind of like the purpose of like the NCI's uh, mission to just kind of accelerate drug discovery by making everything kind of uh, publicly available. Um, but that's not to say that, uh, you know, companies can take this idea and then kind of run with it, with the further, with their own cell line panels, you know, um, because there are publications that are coming out that are showing the utility of such studies, like looking beyond just a single cell line and kind of being able to discover unique patterns from cancer line to cancer line uh, that are being taken advantage of by chemists so that we can develop like more uh, selective small molecules. Yeah. Um, discovery, uh, all of discovery versus just standard reversible inhibitors. Yeah. I would say in the past 20 years, it is skyrocketing in, like in, the, in the interest. I think that some of the most successful chemotherapies, especially, are all covalent inhibitors. Um, and I think it's a relatively new concept, but covalent inhibitor, inhibitors have been around for a while. Like, like asp I think like the acetaminophen. Yeah, like acetaminophen and like the beta lactams that like, you know, like those are all like covalent inhibitors. Um, so that's been around for a while, but there was just a lot of hesitation of adding on like a new an electrophile onto your drug because it's probably going to hit multiple things. But I think we've gotten better at showing, we've gotten better at the design of small molecules and also at the assays that help us actually show there's not that many off targets. So yeah, I would say there's there's a lot of interest and it's become very popular. And I'd say majority of companies are probably working on something like that. Yeah. Is the, uh, the goal of making this project where if there's new data or updates to data submitted that also going to change the the yeah. is it is it going to be able to be incorporated into the project as well, or is it like set in stone? This is at this stage. Yeah, that's a good question. So yeah, right now, I would say once we're done generating the data, because right now I am 36 cell lines into the 60. So um, I still have, I'm a little bit over the halfway mark. So yeah, we're still generating data for this. Um, but yeah, I think that once we're all done with these experiments, for the most part, I think that that'll be it. It'll just be a matter of compiling everything and making it look nice and, you know, kind of putting it together like on, on an online app. Um, but yeah, that's it. That's kind of the idea for now, but we're open to like maybe going beyond this, but yeah. Yeah. Oh, 